I find All Saints Day a beautiful practice in my annual life because I like to think about the, the varying makeups of the group of people who have sat in these very pews, even just in the 11 years that I've been looking out from here. The faces that now aren't in these pews, but look down upon us from what Hebrews calls the great cloud of witnesses, who having run their race, now cheer us on as we run ours. Uh, I think about one of the first faces I think about is Millie Bossert, who smiled better than anyone I've ever known. Millie Bossert smiled whether the sermon was too long or too short. Are they ever too short? <laughs> Millie even smiled while she could no longer get up out of bed. There were days I wanted to say, you don't have to smile, but smiling was a authentic reflection of her internal being. I have to remind myself to smile, but Millie just lit up a room. I think about uh, names, and Ron will remind me the names that I forget. Folks like Barbara Quickstead and G Kitty Guernsey and Alois Anderson, stalwart women who carried this congregation through an incredibly Emily Riley, if I didn't name that, Marilyn would get on me. Um, stalwart leaders who in a time when this congregation was crumbling from internal discord literally held the pieces together with their hands. We could go on all day. We could add Ron and Marilyn, but their faces are still here with us. And we're grateful for that. But even those faces had to look back at other faces, other people who, who were links in a chain to why there was this community doing its best to follow in the way of Jesus, doing its best to offer hospitality to strangers, inclusion to those who were lost, love to those who didn't think they were worthy of it. And those are links that go back 144 years, generation upon generation. And so we don't really get to say, this is our church. We get to say, this is the church we get to be a part of. It's current manifestation of the enfolding wonder of God. And when Paul writes to Timothy, uh, someone he mentored in ministry, someone he now hands off a baton in the relay race of Christian fidelity. He gets to say, I've done my part now. And I hand the baton on to you. In a very similar way, Moses in Deuteronomy is doing the same thing. Moses, from the precipice of the promised land, knows that he will not go to see the fulfillment of all his work. He gets, at best, to give the halftime speech as they go to reap the decades of faithfulness and the fact that he survived all their complaining. And he looks at them and he says, as you walk into that place, there'll be opportunities to choose life and to choose death. At which point I am reminded that preachers are prone to hyperbole. But I think about that in terms of All Saints Day. There is an identity that you have been formed in by the commitment of those who came before you and that you willfully and joyfully take on yourself that you can continue to live into the next generation. God of our ancestors, God of our children's children, generations yet unborn. 
And we stand in this in-between time in a place in which we steward that identity with responsibility, with humble and steadfast practice, honoring what came before, inspiring what will come after. Someone someday had said to Paul, I've run my race, now it's your turn. Someday we had someone say to us, here's what it looks like to run the race. Here is what it looks like to wrestle with a commitment to the flourishing of all creation. For the last four weeks, we've been talking about this idea of cultivation. Uh, that God in Genesis creates and then places humankind into the story, not, as we've often interpreted, to have dominion over the world, but to till and to keep the garden. Quite literally, Genesis 2, 15, and God placed Adam into the garden to till and to keep it. That our responsibility was to take this legacy of abundant life, this legacy of a garden full of amazing potential, and to continue to foster its productivity to the flourishing of all creation not to our own well-being, but to everyone's corporate well-being. And this is what it means to run the race for Paul, to recognize that we are in this moment the gardeners of creation following in the example of those who have come before and at the provocation of the gardener that is God, creator of all that is, and to allow that spirit to form our commitment to ourselves, to God, and to one another. I will quote early and often my love of the psalmist's words in Psalm 8, who looks at the flourishing of creation and says, I cannot believe in the midst of all that you would pay attention, God, to little old me. And yet you have placed me in that garden, Andrew's paraphrasing now, and given me the responsibility and the authority to tend that garden. Or in the literal words of the psalmist, you have made me little less than God. That is what we're cultivating. That is what God has invited us to become co-creators of. Uh, a set of uh, relationships that embolden us and inspire us to dream. A set of commitments and responsibilities that are like the trellis upon which we might grow and we and our children and our neighbors and our friends to become inspired just as others inspired us. We cultivate that in our world and ultimately we commit ourselves to that task of cultivation because it is easy to get itchy ears. I just love that phrase. 
Every generation has itchy ears. We're really good at trying to say it's the new young people that have them. But every generation has itchy ears. All of us get in moments when we want to know, is there a place that would be better for me to be in? Is there a place I would get more out of? Is there a thing I could be doing? The grass is always greener on the other side. And in that world, Moses speaks this profound truth Commit yourself to one another to drown out all the opportunities to water down our witness. I was recently listening um, to a speaker, and he reminded me a truth I've known but tend to forget. And he said, you have to know what your yes is so you can know what your no's are. Right? In a world in which everything will ask your time and your energy and, yes, even your money, first figure out what your yeses are. And then the no's become easier. Because the things we say no to might be wonderful and great, but they can't fit in the bandwidth of your life when you know what your yes is. So what is your yes? Because my yes isn't yours, and yours isn't mine. What are the commitments that have cultivated your sense of identity that give you a sense of deep meaning about your life, and how are you going to recommit to them? How are you going to name and state that these are the commitments that give my life meaning, and I will continue to invest in them, and when the world invites me to have itchy ears, I will know to say no. Laurel, I have a question for you. You didn't know that I was going to do this to you, did you? But this is just a thing they know. They just should just never rest in a pew and expect to not be a participant. Um, did you start playing violin last week? No. Did you start playing violin just in time to start teaching it at the uh, high school and junior high? Because no. let's be honest, junior high kids, you really don't need to know how to play the violin, right? <laughs> you do. When did you start playing violin? Uh, age three. Age three. Okay, well, maybe I should ask someone else. No. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's, that's not necessarily the standard you have to go for. And how many hours do you think you've played violin? This is like asking how many people have been members of this church, isn't it? It's somewhere above 200 and a little less than 20,000. But tens of thousands. So uh, there's a... A beautiful moment from a, a weird source um, that is Frederick, uh, Frederick Nietzsche in his book Beyond Good and Evil. And he's reflecting in a book in which he is, uh, and I'll name this, impugning religion. And I know that. Um, but he reflects that there is nothing wonderful in this world that doesn't stem from long obedience in the same direction. Right? That doesn't mean that you can't find joy. I've picked up a lot of instruments and played them and found joy. The first time Danielle picked up a trombone and she could only get it out to like position two, she had a lot of fun. Nobody else did. There, uh, so Nietzsche reflects whether we want to talk about politics or religion or art or music. He lists all those things in his list. It has always been thus that something beautiful only comes when we engage those with long obedience in the same direction. Itchy ears invite us to have short attention to a lot of things. Discipleship, the flourishing of creation, asks us to think about what are the things to which we want to give our long obedience in the same direction? What are the things to which we want to commit our lives to because they give us both deep meaning and we have just enough temerity to imagine 
They give the world joy and abundant life and flourishing. One of the things I love about what has happened with this sanctuary is that you never know when someone's practicing in here. When Laurel, as she will in a couple weeks, brings high schoolers over here to practice on a Monday and a Tuesday before a Tuesday night concert, and just down the hallway in my office, I get to hear beautiful music happen. Or when Ryan is practicing on this organ, and if you don't know this, Ryan practices on this organ a lot because long obedience in the same direction. And it's got like playing with your feet. Who can even do that? I get to hear all that, and I can't do all that. But I find this deep appreciation in the joy of the people who can. Their yes enriches my life. I hope to find in my life, with my life, a yes that I have that's my yes that enriches theirs and the world's. I want you to find your yes that enriches me and our community and our globe and our universe because we have all been invited to join God in creating this wonder that's so beautiful, it's impossible to imagine that you and I were a part of it. That's so wonderful that in a moment when we invite you to bring up your pledge card, you're gonna wanna do that, I hope. Not because you should do it, though be honest, some of you will, not because you have to do it, but that's what Nietzsche is railing against, because it happens, but because we get to do it. We get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, not, not for us, but also not for us, but for the flourishing of all creation for joining God in cultivating a world that is not just good, but very good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.